it's a great pleasure to introduce our final speaker. Safina Hussein has been committed to girls' education in India since 2002. She's also worked with rural and urban communities in South America, Africa, and Asia. And while based in San Francisco, she was the Chief Executive Director for Child Family Health International and the Board Chair of the International Development Exchange. She was raised in New Delhi, studied at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences, and was recently elected as one of the Asia Society's Asia 21 Young Leaders. Let's all give her a very warm welcome to TEDxASB. Nagina Bano was a child bride. She got married very, very young. And as she says, she says, my in-laws tortured me. They beat me, abused me, and I was too young to be able to do anything about it. And then when she had her first child, they abandoned her. They threw her out of the house. And she had nowhere to go. She really had no idea what to do with her life and how she was going to survive and her own baby. But she said, she said, there was one thing. I had a little bit of education. So finally with that, I got a job in the village. And I was able to support myself and my child. And she said, there was one thing that made me realize that I didn't want any of my other, you know, the girls in the village to go through what I went through. I didn't want them to be married young. And I wanted to make sure that every girl in my village got an education. Today, she works as Team Balika. Team Balika are champions for girls' education. Balika basically means girl-child in Hindi. So Team Balika is a cohort of people who've come together to be champions and to support girls' education in India. She said something to me that, that has always stayed with me. She said, you know, my education is the only thing that nobody can beat out of me. They can't steal it from me. No flood, no famine can take it away. It's always mine. And I found that incredibly inspiring that her education gave her so much strength. But Nagina Bano is not the norm. She's the exception in our country. Only one in a hundred girls makes it to class 12 in India. That means all of us here who have a grade 12 and above education are exceptions. We're the one percenters. Worse than that, 68% of girls in Rajasthan are married before the legal age. And what's even more horrifying is that 15% of those are married below the age of 10. 40% of our girls drop out before primary school. And of the kids that are left in school, only 15% can read a simple story in Hindi, which is our own native language. The situation is really, really dismal as far as our government school system goes. Um, what I wanted to do is give you an idea of what a rural school or a tribal school in our country really does look like. And I made a visit recently, just a few months ago, and I went to two schools. The first school I went to, the headmaster was sleeping inside, and the head teacher was sleeping outside on a motorcycle. <laughs> that visit ended quite quickly and with awkwardness all around. There's not much to do. Um, we went to the second school. And uh, this one had around 40 children and um, um, a female headmistress and one teacher, one assistant teacher. We went in, uh, we sat in the principal's office and we talked about, you know, how the school was functioning and, and they showed me all their files, the attendance records, the enrollment records and everything was perfect. It was absolutely brilliant. If a child had dropped out, there were letters, affidavits, all sorts of official looking things attached to why the child had dropped out. It really, it makes my own files look supremely disorganized and shabby, the way those records were kept. So after looking at that, we said, can we spend some time with the children? And they said, no, that's not possible. Because they're sitting for an exam right now, you can't disturb them. Um, so we said, no, we'll wait. So we hung out outside and we just waited. Um, and then after a while, I think they got fed up and they said, okay, come on in. Um, and they brought us into a, a grade four um, classroom. And there were about 20 kids in there and it was really fun we started playing with the kids and doing lots of really fun games and then um, I said to them I said come on let's look at your textbooks and they said we don't have any 
So I said, but you've got your school bags right next to you. They said, yeah. So I said, do you have anything in the bag? And they pulled out their notebooks. So we looked through their notebooks, and page after page was this sort of illegible writing, but every page was full. So I asked one of the kids, I said, can you read something out from the notebook? And they said, I can't read. We said, okay, maybe not from your notebook. And then we wrote some words on the blackboard. And we said, can you read these? Really simple words like a chair or table or something in Hindi. And they couldn't read that either. They were grade four kids, and they were completely illiterate. So they had no textbooks. So I said, how did you really manage to write in your notebook so much? And they pulled out what's called a kunji in India. It's a guide. And basically it takes the entire curriculum and breaks it into a question and answers. So you don't ever have to learn anything. You can mug it all up and reproduce it at an exam. And it's too depressing to really describe in more detail, so I will not. But it's basically all these kids had a guide that they just copied from without being able to read, without even understanding anything. So I asked the teachers, I sort of brought them back in, and I said, you said they were just giving an exam. Can we see the papers? And they brought the papers, and the papers were completely full, really well written out. So I asked the kids, I was like, how did you write this exam paper? And they looked at me smiling like I was some sort of a complete fool and idiot. They said the master wrote it on the board and we copied it. <laughs> like, what's so difficult to understand, you know? So I looked at the teacher and I said, why did you do that? And he looked at me and he goes, I can't exactly send blank papers to the district office. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a complete farce if it wasn't depressing, and if, it, if our children's futures didn't depend on it. You know. But it's, it's a crazy situation. And, and then the principal I was speaking to, and she said, you know, right now we're really stressed out because our um, government visit has not taken place. Once that happens, we'll be a little bit more relaxed. And I thought, wow, <laughs> maybe the earlier school I went to has already had the government visit, which is why they were so relaxed, <laughs> that they were able to fall asleep on their motorcycles. <laughs> um, so what's the problem? Is it money? You know, money is always good. You, you, you find a problem and you think, let me just throw more money at it. Right? That's the easy way to, to solve stuff. And we really thought about this. I've been doing this for years, and we were really thinking about it, saying, is it money? Will putting more money into the government schools really solve these problems? And we sort of looked at it, and we saw the government's already spending about 7,500 rupees per child per year. That includes books, midday meals, teacher salaries, all of that sort of all-inclusive. Um, you know, and the, but what do you really get for that money? Because the thing that we were coming down to is that we felt that it wasn't money that was really the problem. What was essentially the problem was the rate of return, the efficiency of that money. So what do you get for spending about 7,500 rupees per child per year? And we did a sample, and out of 500 schools, we found 10% were out of school, around 25% were not attending, so 35% of the kids were just out completely, were not benefiting from any investment in education. And from the ones that were left behind, only about 15% could read. So you spend about 6 to 10 lakhs per rural school, and all you're able to achieve out of that money is to get 15% of your kids to be able to read a simple story in Hindi. That kind of sucks. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely the poorest sort of return that you can get on your, on your investment. So what we decided, the way we looked at the problem was that the government schools were failing because of ownership issues, right? A private school works. What is a private school work? Parents pay money, they expect results, right? You've got uh, a governing body, you've got trustees, maybe board of directors, you've got various levels of ownership, governance, and accountability. What happens in a government school? It's centrally controlled and bureaucratically managed. Teachers are hired at, a, at, you know, at the state level and then are farmed out across the state and district. They have absolutely no accountability or ownership to the parents. Parents are illiterate and not able to exert any control over the school system. So we felt that if government schools were owned, if they had strong ownership structures, we would be able to transform them. So how do you do that? 
what's sort of like the first step of creating community ownership of a government school? First, we empowered parents. We created parent bodies and we taught them how to do a school assessment, which basically meant helping parents to recognize what is a good school and what's a bad school. You know, what are the things that a good school should have and how, where does their school stand? And then really teaching, training and supporting them to say, how do I move my school from being a really poor and bad school over to a good school? What is it that I need to do? What sort of action plans do I need to make? And I know school assessment's a really big word. And you know, I, if you just ask me, I may not even be able to spell it really quickly. But so how do you teach parents who are illiterate to do school assessments? But we developed all these tools, these really visual tools that you can actually, and uh, the pictures of, of that, where you can see pictures saying, do you have a toilet? Do you have adequate classrooms? Do you have a boundary wall? Do you have electricity? Do you have books and materials? So sort of looking at it picture-wise so the parents could really be able to understand and be able to impact change. So does it help? Does it make any difference when parents are owning and running a school? These were the results we saw. In the 500 school sample, we saw over 3,000 girls were brought into the school system who had previously been never enrolled. We saw girls' toilet jumped from 44% to 71%. And it's kind of weird to think that <laughs> earlier only 44% of the schools had a girls' toilet because I wouldn't send my daughters to school if there was no bathroom for them to go to. And I have two daughters. Drinking water went up from 46 to 82%. So essentially, when parents were able to see that schools were lacking in certain things, they took it upon themselves to improve the school. And cumulative, this is just a 500 school sample, but cumulatively, we've had over 20,000 girls who've been brought back into the school system through this. So the results are amazing. You just have to give parents some control. But there is one roadblock. It's a massive roadblock. Most of my, the children in the school are first-generation learners. Their parents cannot read or write. So a parent can see if there's a toilet required or drinking water or other infrastructure pieces, but a parent cannot, being illiterate, impact the classroom environment. So you can get it up to a certain point, then what do you do after that? And learning is obviously <laughs> the key point of having children come to school. And this is not something that we've struggled with alone. There are a lot of people in the social sector that come up against this problem, is how do you empower parents to impact literacy when they themselves cannot read or write? So last year, we tested a concept, the concept of Team Balika that I spoke about earlier. These are basically young people from the village. They were committed. They were passionate about girls' education. We trained them to become catalysts for school reform. So 140 of our team Balika members started going inside the government schools and we trained them in really fun activity-based learning that was really child-centric and joyful. And so 140 team Balika members were going inside the classroom three times a week and working with children in the primary school to be able to impact learning outcomes. And outside, they were supporting parent bodies in enrollment, attendance, retention, infrastructure, and other pieces. So recently, I visited Rekha. She works as our Team Balika member, and she took me into her classroom. And it's amazing to see, because they're not trained teachers. They're just young people from the village. But you enter their classroom, and you'll see kids are sitting in, in different sort of circles. The first group was still learning the alphabet. But they weren't learning the alphabet by saying A, B, C, D. What they were doing was they were writing it on each other's backs and then guessing. Or they would write it in the air and their friends would guess. And there was a lot of giggling and there was a lot of fun. Then there was the other group that maybe knew the alphabet but was now learning to make words. And they were working with flashcards and little puzzles and word games, making first their own name, then their friend's name, but really learning through a lot of activity and a lot of fun. And then finally, there'd be a group of kids who could perhaps maybe string together a sentence. But they were reading story cards, little flashcards with each other and having fun. And that was incredible to see, because these are 18 to 22-year-olds from the village, that they could come into the, you know, into the government school, into the classroom, and be able to do this. 
Currently, we have 620 Team Balika members. So what were their results? Just in about three months, we saw Hind this is just really because it was a pilot in three months, we saw Hindi reading jump up from 15 to 35 percent. English reading from 9 to 29 percent. And maths things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc. jumped from 11 to around 29 percent. So what's really happening? What's really happening is that between the parents and the team Balika, now there's ownership of that school. The barrier between parents and the community is sort of broken, and the community can actually come into the school system and be able to impact enrollment, attendance, and learning outcomes. This year, we plan to go up to 1,000 team Balika. And the cost of this, so what's the cost? We talked earlier that 7,500 rupees is what the government's spending. We spent an additional 100 rupees per child per year. And that was it. But that 100 rupees went not for anything else, but just to create that community ownership. And it completely raised the, le the rate of return on the investment. We had now only 1% of the kids were out of school, about 15% were not attending, and obviously the ones who were reading and writing shot up dramatically. And the other thing was it was completely sustainable. So we were sort of peripheral to the process after a while. I had a donor who went down to the field, um, and he came back and he said to me, he said, Sophina, it's very nice. You know, it's really good to see everything. But next time, show me something that you've done. And I was like, why? He said, you know, we go into the villages, and the parents say, come, let, let me show you the toilet we built. And the team Balika said, let me take you into the classroom and show you what I do. And when we talk about you, they say, yeah, they're very nice people. So this year, we will go to 1,000 team balikas and 4,500 schools. And it's important because this is a battle that we really must win if India is to be civilized, just, and equitable. In the true sense, if India is to be India shining, then we have to educate our girls. Team Balika are champions for girls' education. I am Safina Hussain. I am Team Balika. Thank you. If I could have all of our speakers stand up one more time, please, Safina. Our tabla players. Our tabla players. They're here some. Ah, they're in the back. Thank you all.